13 days ago, that commitment changed. Because he's evacuated 5,500 American citizens and their family members and 120,000 total people over the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Does the president have any mistakes that he thinks he made during this withdrawal in Afghanistan that he wants to learn from? Well, I would say I think the president's been pretty clear that we all uh, had an expectation that the Afghan National Security Forces would fight harder in the end, would fight against the Taliban. For the Americans who are currently in hiding and who very much want to come home, not the other set, um, what is the administration's message to them? Should they try and head to the border? Should they try and book a flight out of there? Or should they remain in hiding? and hope that the diplomacy kicks in. We are in touch with as many of them who we can make contact with through a range of means. Uh, that continues. It's been a tough week for Jen Psaki, actually a tough few weeks. She was widely criticized for an out-of-office email message when the Afghanistan crisis began, and it's kind of gone downhill from there. Our next guest works steps from the Oval Office and the office of the Vice President, Alyssa Farah, former Trump White House communications director, joins us now. Alyssa, uh, in a purely professional sense, you almost have to feel bad for Jen Psaki standing up there defending this. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, people forget Jen Psaki was the State Department spokesperson under the Obama administration. She's actually extremely well versed on foreign policy. And, and knowing Jen well enough, I can tell you that she's got to know this is a disaster. She has to know she's defending the indefensible and trying to play creative with different wording, saying they're not stranded, they're just left there for now in these different kind of word tactics. I mean, I'm sure she's feeling very frustrated by yeah. it, but listen, while she was on uh, heading out, putting out her out of office reply, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken was apparently in the Hamptons while Afghanistan was falling. So clearly Biden world was not prepared for this. Yeah, that's, I think that's very fair to say they weren't prepared, and, and clearly they didn't expect it. You don't do that if you were expecting this incoming crisis. As you listen to the president and also to Jen Psaki, you get this feeling that they say uh, the success of the airlift and getting 100-plus thousand people out is ours, and the failures belong to your former boss. Take a listen. My predecessor, the former president, signed an agreement with the Taliban to remove U.S. troops by May the 1st just months after I was inaugurated. The previous administration's agreement said that if we stuck to the May 1st deadline that they had signed on to leave by, the Taliban wouldn't attack any American forces. But if we stayed, all bets were off. You're shaking your head, you can just go ahead. This, this is b bizarre spin, and it's it's trying to place blame elsewhere. The Biden doesn't want the buck to stop with him. A couple of things. So the Trump deal with the Taliban, this wasn't signed in blood. This wasn't a binding agreement in any sense. It was like any sort of diplomatic agreement, something that was evolving, that was changing with time. So we agreed to something that all parties came on board with, but then the Taliban did at times engage in some hostilities and we re-upped our force presence. We made it at every step of the way, uh, it was conditions based under the Trump administration. That's why we did not rapidly yeah, but, drop but down. Fair, the, but fair, okay, I under, understand that there's nuances here, but it, at one point the U.S. had a, a policy that we did not negotiate with terrorists and the people who sat down, the first high level meeting, with the Taliban was Secretary of State Pompeo sitting down in Doha with the negotiators. Hold on. And it was also the, the former president, President Trump, who said he might invite the Taliban to the White House. Uh, so yeah, never, th th this I is negotiating with terrorists, is it not? Well, I never agreed with the optics of hosting them at Camp David or even on U.S. soil. I'm of the mind that that's a bit of an outdated philosophy that you're not willing to meet with adversaries. We were in a war for 20 years, so anytime someone's willing to come to the diplomatic table and try something in a conditions-based approach where we've got a backstop of the overwhelming force of the U.S. military to come in if they don't meet their requirements, okay. I think that's a good thing. I'm not of the mind that we could have never had diplomacy with the Taliban. But I'd also note this. There's, there's a special spin coming from the Biden White House where they're pointing to the success of transcom's uh, ability to evacuate so many people from Afghanistan in the last two weeks. That is a testament to how the U.S. military can accomplish virtually anything when empowered by our leaders to do so. However, they tied the hands of our military from securing 
our air, from securing Bagram Airport, from securing Kabul, from evacuating U.S. citizens. Had they used that same military might, we may not have 14 Americans dead in an unfolding humanitarian disaster in well, Afghanistan. Uh, certainly, if you, you, the sources I talked to say that the military was told to do this incredible mission, but by the way, you can only do it with 6,000 people. So uh, that, that's a fair point. I, I guess, though, I, I get back to this issue of the Trump administration beginning this deal with the Taliban is when you were in the administration, wasn't there any fear that the Taliban was going to end up going back on this deal because that's what terrorists do? There certainly was, which is why we had clauses and clauses to have ways that we could respond if they didn't follow through. So one example, this is probably not well remembered in history, but shortly after the inking of the peace deal in November of 20 or November of 2019, there was actually an ISIS-K attack on a stadium in Afghanistan. And immediately American sources assumed it was the Taliban. And we were ready to cut ties and to break the contours of the agreement because of that attack. And we were ready to do that at the flip of a switch. It turned out it was ISIS-K trying to You're, stifle the peace talk. Alyssa, I, want, I just want to get you on, on this because I think it's an important point. Uh, this is from Politico. Uh, the I word looms. McCarthy faces internal pressure to go harder at Biden on Afghanistan. House GOP has resisted an impeachment call, and the Freedom Caucus isn't going there yet. But some see the debate is inevitable. Is talking about impeaching a president or demanding that he resign when you're in the minority in the House and the Senate seems kind of far fetched, ridiculous, uh, unserious to use as a talking point, does it not? I agree. I think both Democrats and Republicans have overutilized and overpoliticized impeachment, something our founders intended to be a last resort. I do think there should be firings and there should be resignations yeah. because this has been a total debacle. But no, impeachment is a step too far. Right. Well, uh, appreciate the perspective as always. It's great to see you. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you in the coming weeks. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, something the Republicans certainly will 